Giggity. <laughs> um, all right, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to today's community call. Um, we're going to go through some. I may have to turn off the chat. Um, OK. Um, <laughs> Her usual, um, the session's being recorded because we're going to share some, we're going to walk through some some cool stuff and we just thought it'd be useful to have it recorded. Um, oh, this is being recorded. Don't edit that first part out. Sorry. Okay. Hi, Rob. I'm going to mute you. Okay. You're just uncontrolled. Okay. Um, so just uh, use the, I mean, the chat's already being used, but do say hello um, and tell us where you're joining from. Um, and throughout, oh, this will be a pretty loose se session. So if you have questions, like pop them in the chat as per usual, but also I'll, I'll probably pick them up as we go. Um, we'll have time for a Q&A at the end, but also like you can feel free to interrupt. Um, this is intended as a discussion and a dialogue and an opportunity for us to tell you about what we're working on for you guys and how we're responding to things that you've told us. So if it's more of a dialogue, like we're super up, up for that um, as per usual. Um, and if you need anything as usual, send, just drop us an email at community at wildlabs.net. Um, and okay, um, uh, community at wildlabs.net. Um, and that just comes to me and I'll, I'll help you out and um, send you anything or connect you with anyone you need to. Um, lovely to see you all all checking in. Um, OK, so today we're going to run through a quick introduction to Wild Labs. Um, it might be old news for a lot of you, but I think it's probably helpful to just get us all on the same page about what Wild Labs is. Um, a bit of the history and some some transparency around um, some of the government governance and, and how we run the program. Then we're going to talk through uh, the results from our community survey. We'll probably focus, well, we will focus mostly on the 2020 results, but um, we're going to share some of the 2018, 2019 um, data as well. And then we'll talk a bit about um, the upcoming programs and then we'll have time for a Q&A. Um, yeah, okay, so get, to get us started, a um, little intro to Wild Labs, a bit of background. Wild Labs is the first global open online community for conservation technology. It was launched in 2015 um, as a collaboration of uh, NGO partners, Conservation International, Flora, and Flora International, WCS, WWF and ZSL. Um, and it was launched uh, to create a place online, an open place where um, conservationists could connect with each other, um, find out about how to use technology, how people are using, how other people are using technology, um, and uh, to ask and answer questions um, about best practice for using tech for, for conservation applications, and then to find new collaborators, both in the conservation field, but more and more in the tech field as well, um, to uh, both improve how we're using technology that already exists, but also um, to develop new um, technology and, and spark innovation so that we have new tech um, being applied in conservation, um, conservation questions. Um, uh, sorry, I just need to turn off my um, uh, my team's chat so I can just focus. Right. Um, Wild Labs is, has grown over the last six years to uh, a global community of five and a half thousand expert, experts over 120 countries. Um, this slide just shows a um, uh, it shows a snapshot of just a few of the conversations. There's 12 conversations shown there. There's more than a thousand on our platform. Um, and just demonstrating how the platform is being used by conservationists and technologists all over the world to source um, uh, information and connections uh, to answer questions and develop, um, to develop new tech. Um, some key stats for you. Like I said, it's a, a global community, 5,000 members. Um, on average per month, we get about five and a half thousand uh, visitors, 20,000 page views and 170 posts um, per month on the platform. In 2020, we had 27 virtual events um, that were intended by two and a half thousand um, people around the world from 60 different countries. Um, and this year, we're probably on track to be close to 30 or 40 um, virtual events. Um, 
one of the stats we care a lot about um, is the fact that we have, this is just in 2020, we had 46% uh, female speakers across all of our events. Um, 20, um, in, this year we're on track to be actually above 50% and we're moving towards um, similar, uh, tracking similar metrics and, and achieving um, similar targets for diversity and background of our speakers as well. Um, we, in addition to the platform and our virtual events, we also run um, uh, engagement programs and challenges like our Human Wildlife Conflict Tech Challenge and our Tech for Wildlife Photo Challenge, which was um, which we run on Twitter every year and it's uh, encouraged people to take a photo of how they're using tech in the field or in the lab and share a photo and tell us a bit about how they're using tech for wildlife. And over the five years that's been running, we've had thousands of photos and videos shared. Um, it's reached more than 1.5 million people and it's really established the Tech for Wildlife hashtag as a as the go-to place for, for conservation tech on Twitter. And really, I think one of the things to take away from the, it, this is that our community, it does exist on our platform, but it also exists in our events, in our in-person events, our virtual events, on Twitter, on YouTube, and that Wild Labs, Yes, our platform's really important, but Wild Labs is really our community and we are wherever our community gathers and um, uh, community is the, at the heart of what we do and um, is what we think about every time we're des designing a new program or finding a new funder or all of our work is, is about building the community and serving the community. Um, wherever they congregate and wherever they're working and just we've also had um, projects incubated years ago um, growing and and uh, reaching a point where they're, they're um, being showcased in the New York Times, the Times and the BBC so projects that were like the Bear ID project and Arabata's um, elephant infrared camera project were projects that we helped found in and incubate in the, in the Wild Labs community. Um, the best way to get a taste of like tech for wildlife and how technology is being used in conservation is to just check out the tech for wildlife feed. That link takes you straight there and it gives you a nice feed of all of the photos from Twitter shared over from the challenge. And it's just, it's become such a fantastic resource to send, like we send a lot of journalists there, to be honest, who, who contact us looking for projects and looking for things to showcase. So it's it's a really good resource. We also send a lot of um, tech companies and funders. So um, as a starting point, it's been a, a fantastic resource and it's something we're really looking forward to growing and integrating into our new platform a, a lot better. To give you a bit of background, um, in case you weren't aware, Wild Labs actually is um, a partnership of uh, five NGO organisations that founded it. And we have strategic oversight um, from a steering group that's made up of the, the, the technology leads from each of these, these partner organisations. And this group um, has a strategic oversight and governance of, of the Wild Labs um, programmes and um, platform. And um, uh, current, the current chair is Eric Fegris at Conservation International, but it, it cycles through and we have a, an MOU between all of those partners that lays out the governance and um, voting rights. Um, we also have three full-time team members, um, uh, myself, Talia and Ellie. And I think I think a lot of people really underestimate how, how big our team is, but this does really undersell how many people are involved in Wild Labs. And while we ha only have three full-time staff members, we have um, a huge number of people that put time into, into Wild Labs, whether it's partners. We involve a lot of um, staff members at partner organisations to, to help deliver programs. Um, and we we work very much through, through partners beyond our NGO partners. So for the last 18 months, for example, we've been working very closely with the satellite applications, Catapult, and the team over there has been really fantastic and, and helped us move a lot of work forward um, and helped us grow a lot. And so, and also it, it doesn't acknowledge, I can see in the chat that that um, the point has been made that we have a lot of volunteers and a lot of uh, our community members put put in a huge amount of time to, to, um, to Wild Labs. So it really is a, a hugely collaborative effort. Um, and just to give you a snapshot of our funding, because I think it's really important that we're transparent about, um, <laughs> I think it's really important that we're transparent about our funding and especially as we're 
um, more and more taking on partnerships with tech companies and and um, exploring things like sponsorship. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone has about our funding and and um, the the approaches we're taking and the philosophies philosophies we have about uh, funding this program. Um, so we can we can answer them now or uh, during the Q and A, or you can always just email me as well, and I'm happy to answer. But really, I think the thing to take away from this is the value of um, uh, like the the bar graph. You can see um, uh, you can see that we heavily um, relied on. It, it was critical to have the support of our NGO partners. SC just means steering committee, um, but that really represents the the investment that our NGO partners um, put into Wild Labs over a sustained time frame um, to get us to a point where we'd reached a maturity where we could start having our own partnerships and bringing in our own funding to, um, uh, to a bigger and bigger scale um, to support community programs and to answer needs that the, the community is having. And more and more as we're um, uh, evolving and, and maturing as a, a community and a collaboration, we're seeing our role is um, helping bring in new funding and um, making uh, new funding sources accessible to our community um, and helping facilitate that process. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things is that um, uh, because we're like we were formed as a partnership of all of these NGO organisations, we did have some restrictions around uh, the sort of fundings that we could go to. So really our focus has always been on going for new funding sources so that we're, we're increasing the amount of funding that's available for conservation and for conservation technology. Um, yeah, so I mean, happy to answer questions about our approaches, but looking forward, um, you know, uh, our annual operating um, costs, uh, our base operating costs are about 150 to 200,000 pounds a year. And we have this tension between whether we grow as a team or we work through partnerships and we really want to make sure we're sustainable and able to um, deliver programs and deliver value for for conservation organizations and, and the community um, and not be nest, but also the tension of not being tied into having to raise heaps of money to just cover our own costs like like from my perspective, Wild Labs is very like our success is when our community is successful. So what have we can do to deliver programs that are helping our community is our purpose. It's not to fundraise for ourselves. It's to make sure we have the the resources in place to do the work that our community needs to actually achieve their goals. So yeah, I can go into it, but um, just suffice to say, if you if you have questions, please do please do ask. And um, just to say also, if you want to find out more about Wild Labs and our background and our history and where we've come from, um, I'd encourage you to go and look at our About page and have a look at some of our annual reports. Um, that it's We fed a lot of the data from the community surveys into these annual reports. And there is also actually a 2021, but it's in a currently in a Word document. Um, it's got all the information. I just haven't had time to put it into a nicely designed document. So if you are curious to see what our 2020 report is, um, covers off, just email me and I'll send you a copy. Um, OK, that's enough about governance and background about Wild Labs. Talia, how are you feeling? Are you OK uh, to run or? Yes, I'm OK. OK. Cool. Thank you. All right, hi, everyone. Um, and yeah, thanks for that pass off, Steph. Uh, as Steph mentioned, we have been running annual surveys, and as most of you probably already know, We've been running annual surveys uh, for our community since 2018, and um, we will mostly focus on the 2020 data today, but we're going to drop in little bits and pieces from the 2018 and 2019 surveys as well to just give you a sense of how things have kind of evolved over time. So in our 2020 survey, we had 248 respondents um, from 30 countries, which is up pretty significantly from 2019, um, where we had 119 responses, also from 30 countries. Um, and our ratio of female to male, Steph mentioned that that's been kind of a focus for us, also improved slightly from 30% female respondents to 70% male. Um, and this year it went up to 35% female to 65% male. A little bit more information on demographics. 
Um, so 2020 was the first year that we expanded our survey reach to include the whole global community and not just our Wild Labs members, um, which let us kind of get a broader picture of the sector. And so you can see on the bottom of this slide here, the breakdown of who of the respondents um, said that they were engaged as an active member, which we defined as attending an event or logging into the platform and engaging um, in the past year. So it's about 50-50, slightly more Wild Labs members than non-members. Um, and then, sorry, can you go back really quickly, Steph? Um, just on occupation, we also saw some change. So this year we had a pretty, or in 2020, we had a pretty even split between conservationists, technologists, and academics and researchers, um, with a handful of students in early career uh, and other folks. But we saw that that was a pretty um, significant increase in diversity there from 2019, where we had almost half of our respondents were conservation practitioners and only 15% were from the tech sector. So we're definitely seeing more diversity in who's engaging with us. And part of that might be because it was expanded beyond our community, but we're also seeing that diversity reflected in the community too. All right, so now we'll get back into some of the questions that we asked you all um, and what you told us. So. Uh, just as a little preface to this, we're going to focus on the wild lab specific data and we'll talk about if anyone's taken our annual survey, you know that we the second half of our survey is about the broader sector. Um, so these are going to be focused on the platform and what you've been telling us about our programming. So first of all, we asked, uh, have you experienced any of the following forms of interaction in the wild labs community, basically to get a sense of of what we're providing to you, what is the most useful? Um, and pretty consistently, we hear that events, finding information, and exchanging knowledge are the most useful for our members. Um, in 2019, these were the same order, but information finding was first, then knowledge exchange, and then events. So we've seen kind of a growing importance of events in our programming as well. Okay, so. Um, this is a question that we are going to present 2018, 2019, and 2020. A net promoter score is basically just getting a sense of the people who are engaging with our platform. Um, like, so we, the question is, how likely are you are you to recommend us to a friend or colleague? And there's a little description down here of what it means, but it's basically um, getting a sense of how positive do you feel about the work that we're doing. Um, the scores can range from zero to 100, or sorry, minus negative 100 to positive 100. And um, it's generally considered that anything higher than zero is good, plus 50 is excellent, and 70 or above is exceptional. So this is a score in 2018. You see a pretty even split between people who are detractors, so not having the best experiences, um, kind of passive or somewhere in between and then promoters. And then if we go to 2019. Just to add, uh, to be a promoter, you have to like score like very likely or likely and anything below that, like like nine or 10 out of like how, how likely you are to to um to recommend it. Every, anything below that, even if it's like a six or a seven is basically deemed negative on this score. Right, so, so it is a pretty harsh, yeah, it's a pretty harsh scale. Um, uh, did I click through? No. Oh, yeah. So you see in 2019, we have a much smaller se segment of people who are uh, deemed detractors, and then pretty much the same for passive, and then many more promoters. So half of the people responding were considered promoters. And then 2020, we see a massive improvement. Again, almost 70% of respondents are considered promoters, and only 8% are detractors. And our score right now, again, I had said anything above 50 is generally deemed excellent and 70 is exceptional. So we're getting up there in that range, um, which means we're, yeah, we have the right trend over time. Okay, so the next thing we asked about, asked about um, was, what are, we just wanted to find out what are the main benefits from participating in the community? And um, this is an open ended question, so don't feel like you need to read all these quotes. We have a lot of quotes included here um, because we love sharing what you have all had, what you've all said. But basically they were, they fell into buckets of finding information or kind of consuming, um, connecting with the peer with peers in the community, 
So um, yeah, finding connecting with different stakeholders. Uh, this person said it's elevated their research to a whole level to be connected with people that they might not otherwise be connected with. Um, sharing information and getting answers. A lot of people feel a sense of community and um, are, are happy about finding people who are in the same boat uh, and facing similar problems that they're facing and trying to find similar solutions. And then finally, um, getting involved, discovering how I can help. We hear a lot of this, especially from people in the tech sector who are coming to conservation tech with a lot of technical skills, but don't sh they're not sure quite where they're going to fit in or how they can best contribute. OK, so this is about um, what content people find the most valuable. And we'll go through for this question um, mostly just the, the 2020 data here. But just to clarify for this graph, um, they're ordered by average rating. And we took out the, the data just for clarity that was unable to comment. So this is also indicative of how many people are engaging with these different things. Um, and we've seen, we see that our virtual programming has moved up in the ranks a lot um, over time. It was almost, it was close to the bottom initially, and um, now these are clearly some of the most valuable things that our community sees about engaging with us. Um, Twitter has also moved up substantially, which um, I think reflects our programming and efforts there too. It was, I think, last in 2019, um, and has now moved up to the middle there. So yeah, we, we hear that virtual programs are published resources on the platform, the digest and the Twitter feed are kind of the most um, the most valuable for facilitating the kind of interactions that we just heard about. And just to comment, having that sort of feedback is really helpful for us because it gives us justification for, um, especially in the early days, it was really important because it gave us justification for having funding covering staff time to develop those resources. So having it, Fed back that they're they're really valuable and, and, and worth us spending time on is, is being really useful. So thank you for that feedback. Next slide. Okay, so this is another open-ended question. Um, what discoveries have you made through Wild Labs that have benefited your work? This is another question that allowed us to pull really nice stories into our annual reports um, to show to funders and uh, so we love hearing about these things and also just to know kind of what collaborations happen behind the scenes that we might not know about otherwise. Um, so these again, yeah, so I said open ended. These are kind of the, the main themes that we heard are mostly discovering new technology or applications, um, finding community connections. So again, like who's doing what and where are the gaps in the field, but also finding new collaborators, shared challenges and like minded individuals and kind of that sense of community. Um, people learning about specific analyses or techniques that they didn't know about that have now advanced their work, um, accessing best practice resources. When the WWF conservation tech guidelines came out, that was a big one that a lot of people mentioned were, were super helpful. Um, and then finding employment or funding opportunities has been one that's been increasingly important over the years. And some of these quotes are just, yeah, illustrating that um, this one I really liked at the bottom that was talking about someone coming to the platform and being exposed to issues that they previously found intimidating um, and then also feeling like hearing enthusiasm from the community about what they're doing has made them feel like they have something to offer. Okay so this is about what we should be doing um, kind of in the future and what we what we should be yeah, putting our energy and resources toward the most. Um, so the question is, in the future, how important is it that Wild Labs deliver, delivers the following value? Uh, and we're going to go through for this the, the past years as well, but I'll just highlight here that promoting information sharing, um, kind of enabling capacity building and informing that and engaging tech specialists uh, were the top ones. So in 2018, you can see some overlap there. Um, first was information sharing, then leveraging partners with partnerships with the tech sector was super important at that time for our community. And then ensuring that nonprofits in this space were collaborating on tangible solutions that met the needs of the conservation community. And then we can see in 2019, 
uh, number one and three stay the same, but uh, capacity building moved up to the second place as being something that was clearly really important to the community. And then again in 2020, we see that we have information sharing and capacity building staying the same, but now engaging tech specialists and expertise um, to respond to the challenges in our community is uh, something that's now more important. This was a question in 20, that we asked in 2019 that we adjusted um, in 2020, but we thought it was helpful to share this because it has informed a lot of our programming over the past couple of years. Um, so we asked, think about your technology problems. If we could add new expertise to the community what, that would help you solve them, what would this, these be and why? And again, these were open-ended, so these are just examples, but there were a lot of specific asks around AI, camera traps, data management, um, mostly resources that were going to directly benefit people's work. So the quote here is perhaps some resources to make machine learning based approaches more accessible. Um, and that's been definitely an emphasis in our programming, um, as those of you who attend our events all the time, I'm sure have seen. Um, then scale, scaling, managing tech, collaborating and funding. So that's kind of more the like coordination aspect. And um, this quote's talking about how basically we have this really wonderful active community now with a lot of skill in it um, and motivated individuals. And now we need to kind of have that coordination aspect to see more partnerships and cooperatives and collaboration rather than um, competition. And that should also apply to our, our funding, funding sources and structures. And then finally, mentoring and capacity building, which really directly led into our virtual programming, um, asking for tech specialists who can provide mentorship and feedback, and um, also individuals who can run training sessions in their areas of expertise, which is basically what Tech Tutors was in response to. Yeah, the men just to add in the mentorship and, and handholding, like we, we hear back both via the surveys and by comments from people about the mentorship aspect of, of um, tech tutors and, and people have variously brought up the idea of roaming mentors or like just the idea of having someone to just be able to answer questions on hand and the fellowship program that we've just launched with edge impulses is, is another way that we're directly trying to answer this this need for um, not just capacity building, not just training and not just funding, but also just that reliable expertise to cut through the hype and to, to just be able to be there to troubleshoot and, and help people evolve and um, apply tech more um, effectively and, and to answer questions. Next slide. Okay, so this is kind of that version of this question uh, in the latest in the latest survey in 2020, and we shifted it to ask, what if anything could Wild Labs do to better meet your needs? Um, since we've seen a lot of those developments kind of already take place in the community, we want to know what can we now as a team do um, to help you. And uh, the main categories here were programming. Um, a lot of people have ideas about specific um, webinars, virtual events. Um, Again, this is this quote is very aligned with what Tech Tutors became. So having a web in, webinar by industry or conservation expert on a specific topic. Um, and then people also had a lot of ideas about doing in-person events, which it was, of course, impossible during COVID. Um, but yeah, so a lot of helpful feedback there. A lot of people also have many ideas and forms of input on our platform. Um, one person said, please get rid of your platform and make a better one, which we are doing now. Um, but there were specific suggestions too about offering kind of like a wiki form. That was a really common one um, that would allow kind of more active collaboration and pooling of knowledge. Uh, resources and best practice guidelines is another area that came up a lot. Um, so this one comes up all the time, kind of having easy to digest uh, pros and cons guides of different of different technologies that are available where there are a lot of options in the market and people want to know kind of what they should spend their time on. Um, and that's something we're working on responding to as well. Diversity and inclusion is a big one that we're very aware of um, and that we hear back on every survey too. Uh, this one's specifically about language, um, but about basically increasing our geographic reach and, yeah, I guess expanding our community to not be so heavily biased towards the US and UK, 
um, in Western countries, which we also see in our in our survey that our respondents are also biased um, geographically there. So that that can come in the form of yeah language barriers, but also times of events, um, stuff like that. And then finally, promotion and marketing. Um, a lot of people just say like do better at sharing what you're doing and telling people why they should be participating, which is why we're doing calls like this. Did you want to add something, Steph? Okay. Um, well, just actually, I, I, I shook my head and then I have think, things to say. Um, I just, uh, I will add on that a lot of our virtual programming is responding to these sort of, um, this sort of feedback, but so is our editorial programming and um, things like our fa failure project and a lot of the work that Ellie's leading is um, answering. Uh, we're trying to answer things through the virtual programming, but also um, developing the written resources and um, the quick and dirty guides. Are, are one of the things that we're working on as part of our platform redevelopment and just making just a lot of the information much, much more accessible. So there are a, a multiple layers of how we're trying to bring the information together into this, this centralized hub and make it much more accessible. Right. Okay, so then I mentioned earlier, for the first time we sent the survey out to people who weren't Wild Labs members. So for those that said they weren't active members, we wanted to find out why. Um, and these were the choices we included um, and they're in ranked order of how many people selected them. So first was I don't, just don't know enough about the platform or community. Second was I don't have time to engage. Um, third was other reasons like a lot of people said they just found out about it. They're happy lurking for now so they haven't engaged per se but they're in the community um, or they intend to engage but just haven't had the need to post themselves yet or something. Um, and then a few people said it doesn't offer what I need or it's too hard to find the information I need. Then to those same, the non-members we asked, okay, so you're not a member, is there anything we can do uh, to better meet your needs for a community of practice in this space? Um, and these were open-ended. They were in the same kind of categories, specific programming ideas, um, better promoting ourselves and marketing what we're doing so that people just know about it. Because again, most of the people who weren't engaged said they just didn't know enough about it yet um, or had just found out about it. Uh, specific resources that people maybe came to the platform looking for, like how-to guides on a certain topic, uh, ideas for making the platform kind of snazzier and more accessible and easier to use. And then uh, DEI stuff again around, um, yeah, language barriers mainly, uh, or, you know, just being more inclusive to um, to demographics that are not reaching very well yet. So this is for this was for our community again um, for for all members, not just the non-members. And we wanted to find out what you all think we should be doing five years from now. And this is always one of our favorite questions to ask. There are about a million quotes on the next slide. Um, but just to go over the kind of categories here, a lot of it was about broader reach and inclus inclusivity, um, especially in countries with developing economies in the global south um, and working on kind of leading the way in terms of community partnerships. Um, more regional and local events and hubs, which goes along with that first point, um, just to make people feel like feel a community more directly in those regions specifically. Um, and that maybe even if they aren't able to engage online a lot, that they could, that Wild Labs could have more of these kind of regional hubs that could let people feel like they have that community locally. Um, more best practice, how-to guides, and helping to kind of set and establish industry standards. Um, helping to scale solutions and bring new innovative sustainable funding into this space, which is something we've been really focused on um, with things like the fellowships, which we'll talk about. And then just playing a bigger glo global leadership role. A lot of people had lovely quotes about just how we should be kind of the leaders in this space and just keep doing what we're doing, um, but on a bigger scale. I won't go through all of these, um, but they're basically just yeah, highlighting what I was saying, coordinating global efforts from partners to ensure that we're not competing, but growing this movement, um, becoming or catalyzing funding, conserva catalyzing and funding conservation tech projects, um, being the go to site for this, 
and then a lot of people also had great suggestions about how the platform could play a role in this kind of development, like becoming this interactive portal that really holds everything that someone could need um, in conservation tech. And uh, yeah, kind of how the how the platform evolution could support that. Nice. I that's it. Thanks, Seth. Okay. Um, I'm just. Uh... Just before we talk quickly through programs and um, uh, go on to, are there any questions about the results? All super interesting. Okay, cool. Um, thought I'd just give a moment. Okay, so programming. Um, I think it can be really uh, overwhelming to understand what Wild Labs does and where we're focusing um, just because we do so much and it's it, we get told a lot that it, there's just a lot of information to to take in and I think it really helps to um, just lay out that we're there are four areas that we're focusing on the moment we're a, like we have a philosophy of being really responsive and flexible and um, uh, try being really willing to try things and experiment and work to respond to what our community needs. And I think um, we, like we'll definitely continue doing that, but uh, and we're doing more than just these four things, but these are really our focus areas at, uh, in the next 18 months. Um, so in the first instance, we are focusing on um, evolving our platform and um, delivering a really wonderful rebuild um, so that we're, we're getting better at um, uh, we're giving you infrastructure that, that allows the community to to connect and share information and access information a lot easier. Um, we're going to continue to uh, delivering our virtual events. Hi, Bill. Um, sorry, my dog walked in. Um, uh, delivering our virtual events and expanding this um, this th these programs. Uh, we have a growing uh, body of research and a growing research program, and then we also have our fellowship program. So these are our mo main areas of focus um, over the next eighteen months. So the first one is our platform and I just this is just a sneak peek and our designer might be a little bit upset for me to uh, be for sharing this so just keep in mind that it is very early stage and it is not um it is not finalized it is not polished it is just the direction in which we're going for our platform but this is just a um this is the direction we're going in for for the platform rebuild and I just our whole team cannot wait for you to be able to use what we're building. Um, we're really excited and um, yeah, we just like, we can't wait. We can't wait to use it, let alone um, give it to you guys to use. But um, what we, what we're, tr what we have in our focus is making sure all of the information is really accessible um, and it's really easy to use and it's really easy to discover stuff and you can go there and like be okay I'm interested in camera traps where do I get started or who do I like who's an expert and really just leaning into like um, demonstrating uh, like like showing not telling um, in terms of like seeing how people are interacting and all, all of that sort of stuff so um and I'll also say our focus at the moment is really moving what we have already over onto this new platform and kind of replicating the tools, but just in a, like a massively better way and also opening up um, the tools so that you'll be able to post things yourself in terms of like blog posts and career opportunities and all that sort of stuff. But then beyond that, once we've launched this, this first stage, we have um, a, a lot more features coming and a lot more um sections to the platform coming over the next 12 months and one of the if you recall the funding um the funding graph like the big funding we've had over the last 18 months and the next six months is around rebuilding our platform so we're pouring a lot of resource into this so it should be amazing um and that that's not just the functionality it's also all of the research and the the, the resources that sit on that platform so one of the things that we're building in the coming months is um, a marketplace catalogue of all technologies um, that could be applied to to conservation and so it's you you have a place where you can come and 
like find all the camera trap models and find comparisons and reviews and like a trip advisor for for conservation tech and yeah it's I, I, I honestly, I'm so excited and like we just, uh, we're working with Optifin Digital and we're working with Simon, our designer, and it's just, it's a, and, and the team at the Satellite Applications Catapult as well is, is um, been hugely involved and yeah, we're really excited. So yeah, um, just, that's just a, a, a quick little sneak peek and alongside, so part of what we're doing is as we're opening up tools so that the community has more and more options, like we see you using our current platform way beyond what it's supposed to be used for like our discussion threads like you use them to like some people use them to post blog posts some people use them as q a some people use them as like uh to like do group by purchasing we're going to have functionality where we have specific q a um you can post a question then vote on answers then you have um you can do project updates you can have project pages so that we're alleviating um, a lot of the the burden on our team to produce the resources so that we can actually, so what that means is we'll be able to target our energies on delivering um, more editorial content like our failure series that's coming up and, and be able to have more of our time going into the more in-depth um, sort of reporting and, and supporting community members to do um, share out lessons learned and case studies really, really effectively. So, there's a lot of things happening here and there's a lot of things that we're hoping this new platform will unlock and, and shift how you're interacting with each other. Um, and as much as I believe that our community exists, like wherever it congregates, having a really good platform at the heart of it that can serve as the home for conservation tech where you can come and find everything is really, really exciting. Um, and like, yeah, we're really excited. Will it have, yes, <laughs> will it have Wild Labs merch? Tom, you you honestly do not understand how much our team talks about merch. And yes, um, we're just, we're kind of busy, but yes, it is under discussion a lot. Um, so yes, you'll be able to get a t-shirt at some point. Cool. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a little uh, sneak peek at, at what's happening there. And if you want to be a beta tester, we'd love to have like some people testing out some stuff probably towards the end. We'll probably be launching the, the new platform towards the end of the year, early next year. So if you want to help us um, test stuff, um, let us know. We'd love to, to have um, a group of people just trying out to trying to break it. So we, before we launch it to everyone. Um, nice. Thanks guys. Um, okay, next thing is our evolving program of events. So we run all of our events in seasons um, because one, it allows us to get sponsors for them. Um, so it's a, a helpful thing and sponsors are really critical for us to cover our core costs so that we can keep delivering you programs. Um, and we, our sponsorship never means editorial oversight over anything. It's just like we decide what we want to do and then we go and find a sponsor who also thinks it's a good idea and we decide what we want to do based on feedback from the community. So um, we're always community led. We're not funder led and we and it doesn't mean editorial control at all. But um, the other thing doing things in seasons is that it allows us to stop doing things and shelve them for a while and have an endpoint. And I love that because it means that we're doing Tech Tutor season three, and the next thing we're probably bringing back is our virtual meetups next year, and we're really excited about them. Um, and Tali will talk a little bit about uh, how we're we're actually looking at combining um, virtual meetups with our research work as well. But um, when we think about our our event programs on a couple of different levels, one there's that that goal of convening big picture cross sector discussions, so bringing together. The conservation, the tech, and the academic worlds, and having them converse and exchange ideas, um, and that's our that's our um, our virtual meetup is our flagship program in that space, and really thinking big picture about what's coming down the horizon and and what do we need to be thinking about and aware of, um, and then we have tech tutors, which is looking more one to one, like specific tech technologies and offering tutorials and getting started guides. And we have some ideas about how we're going to expand that. We might not do tech tutors in the current format next year. We might have a regional focus. We might be looking at like, um, we might we, we might be doing it, but we're thinking about how it looks next year and and what we need to respond to and what you guys need from, from that sort of um, 
that uh, sort of programming at, at that level. And then we also have our in-depth training with partners at Free Clouds, Akiba and Jacinta um, has been our first foray into that. And, and part of the functionality we're building into the new site is some um, e-learning stuff to, to make that much more um, easy to work through uh, modules and, and videos, which is really exciting. Um, so Akiba and Jacinta, my God, have so many ideas about things that they would like to do. So we're really excited about, and we see a really big avenue of, of um, need to go um, deliver more in-depth training and and go deeper and 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 um, provide that sort of capacity building and make it really really accessible. So we're super looking forward to collaborating with Free Clouds and also looking at other up other opportunities to do in-depth sort of trainings. Um, yeah, and then we're looking at teardowns and we have lots of ideas about some other other and things brewing behind the scenes in terms of other events that we're we're thinking about um, and other uh, series we're thinking about developing and and as we're considering what we want to do next year we're thinking about like regional focus and and we have a staff member starting in Kenya who's going to be delivering a Kenyan specific event series um, really focused on bringing together the Kenyan network of, of conservation technology actors um, and we're really thinking about the value and um, the different conversations we see and the different interactions we see in the open versus the closed versus the, the recorded or unrecorded events and really making sure we're um, giving different opportunities and facilitating and creating different spaces that um, are bringing people together and allowing them to have deeper conversations and more open conversations. And sometimes that means not recording them. And sometimes it means just having them um, by invitation only and, and having them on a specific topic. and um really playing with the 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 value of, of what's happening there um our, our we always lean towards recording stuff and sharing it out but um part of part of interactions and uh, allowing relationships to form and collab and collaborations form out of relationships is is allowing those different spaces to happen and which is why for tech tutors we have the recorded session and then we have like the after hours where we just have a an unrecorded chat and like talk to each other as 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 colleagues and friends and and exchange ideas around around the same topic. So th we're just thinking through those sort of things, and we're also thinking about pre-recorded versus live events and podcasts and and all of these different um, formats and what they bring to our community and what value they have. Like we love live events because it creates a space like. The pres presentation's great and the information there is fantastic, but really also it's the, the time to cr like create a space where we bring together people and cr like give them a space to talk to each other and connect and share their knowledge. And then uh, the knowledge of our community and the, our participants is absolutely as valuable as the the one person speaking. So, yeah, I, th I, I don't know. I, I, I think there's a lot of value in pre-recorded and and. Um, things that you can do at your own pace, but we'll never, ever stop doing live events because they are just such a space for our community. But anyway, and the other thing we've been talking about for a very long time is doing an in-person technology summit, conservation technology summit. And post-COVID, yes, we'd love to do one and we'd love to do one at Old Petra in Kenya um, and have it as an annual thing or a biannual thing. We don't know, but it's something that we have in our thoughts and and our long term plan. And I know there's a lot of eagerness from a lot of people. So it's something that we're thinking about. And, and you know, I, if you found us during um, the last 18 months, you won't be aware that we, we do a lot of in-person events normally at conferences and uh, play a convening role. So as we emerge from COVID and events start happening again, we'll, we'll be it'll be really interesting to see what our role is doing in-person events or whether we just um, lean into the the inclusiveness and the accessibility of virtual. We don't know yet, but we're thinking about it. Okay, uh, then the third thing we're focusing on is our, our growing research program. Talia, do you want to talk us through this? Yeah. So as I mentioned earlier, um, if any of you have taken any of our surveys, the whole second half is asking about not just wild labs, but moving on to the broader sector and um, kind of what's happening in the field. And you are all, you are all the best um, source of information for that because you're the ones working with these tools every single day. Uh, so in 2020, we kind of wanted to um, 
kind of sees that potential more and formalize the process. So we uh, we partnered with Colorado State University, where I was just getting my master's degree, um, to turn this into a formal assessment to deliver the first state of conservation technology report. Um, and right now, our manuscript is in peer review, and we're hoping that it will be published soon um, to share with you all. And we're also working on kind of an interactive data portal web report um, to make the dry academic paper more exciting and fun to engage with, even though we think the findings are really interesting. Um, so that's been a big focus of our research program so far. Uh, part of this research was also we wanted to supplement the or we did supplement the survey with focus groups with about 50 leading experts in the field sourced a lot from our community, but also from um, non wild labs members and these were super, super insightful discussions. Um, Steph was talking about the value of closed group discussions and we really found that we got really, really valuable insights from just having a safe closed space where people could be honest and share their thoughts. Um, so we, yeah, we included analysis of the focus groups in that manuscript as well and are looking forward to sharing more with you all. Um, can I jump in? Just yeah. just to add with the, the closed focus groups, it, we got really valuable insights, but I think actually everyone who participated also really enjoyed the opportunity to talk with peers in that sort of space and to have the chance to talk like big picture. They all instinctively went to talk like, what's the future? Where are we going? Rather than like short term. So yeah, right. anyway. Yeah, and one thing of note on that is that my academic committee kind of warned against doing focus groups because they said, you know, it's really hard to get people to engage and willing to sign up for these. And we did seven different focus groups to kind of touch on each of the main forms of technology that we were looking at. And we had so much enthusiasm from the community and had people after each focus group saying, like, can we do this every month? Can we do this every year? So. It's just we're so lucky to have a community that's so willing and interested to participate and share insights. Um, so we're doing our best to kind of capture those and do good with them. And that's kind of, that's the point. That's the motivation behind all of this. This whole research program is to kind of capture the valuable insights that you share with us every day and through these kind of more formal assessments and then share that information back with you, um, both to our community, but also to the broader to other sectors like the tech sector and governments and um, to hopefully be able to inform policy and get more resources and um, capacity building and sustainable efforts in our field. And then we also have some other things going on in our research program beyond the direct community stuff in the state of conservation tech. Um, this is just one example we recently did an assessment uh, with Vulcan on kind of the impacts of COVID on conservation work. And then the role of tech in supporting conservationists in these unprecedented times um, and hoping to find out about yeah how, how it support how tech has supported conservationists but also how it could potentially increase resilience to future global disruptions um, and so that report just came out last week i believe we can share the link to it in the chat um, but this is just kind of getting at uh, our motivation to share insights from our community to inform other research as well. Um, and as Steph alluded to earlier, we're looking at also we have another program in the works um, that would combine our virtual programming with our research insights um, to hopefully deliver something even more valuable. Um, because as we said, we have we see the value in those closed group discussions, but want to make sure that we're still keeping it open to the community. Um, so yeah, looking forward to sharing more on that front soon. Uh, and then uh, fellowships. Ellie, do you want to talk about the fellowships? Yes, I do. Hello, Ooh. everyone. So we're very excited. This year we launched our fellowships program with our first fellowship uh, in partnership with Edge Impulse. Before we get to the slide on that, um, I'd like to just talk a little bit about our vision for the wider Wild Labs Fellowship Program. And I know some of you probably came here with questions about the Edge Impulse one. Um, if you have those questions, drop them in the chat. You can also email me personally at um, la.warren at wildlabs.net. 
Um, and I'll get back to you to help you apply before the deadline, which is uh, this Sunday. So the Wild Labs Fellowships, it goes back to this concept that Steph was talking about a little bit earlier, which is the matchmaking and the handholding side of connecting conservation and technology. So there are obviously a lot of different funding and grant programs out there. There are a lot of different fellowships um, that offer money to people who are developing these really cool ideas. And, you know, it's important to let people explore these really cool ideas. We love seeing different innovations, but we also think it's really important for programs like fellowships to offer something a little bit more than just funding that goes towards something that's really neat and really showcases a company's uh, innovations, but isn't necessarily going to make a long-term impact either on the field or on somebody's career path or the wider community. So what we really want to do is find these places where we can make these really strong matches between uh, tech companies that have a really, really strong passion for using their technology to do good and really know that they can make an impact if they can just find the right people to put it into practice. And then finding the people in our community who have those ideas can take that technology, make something new, make something that can be put into the field to make an impact, or can make something that they can present to the community and somebody else can take that idea and run with it. And so that brings us to uh, the Edge Impulse one. So, like I said, the deadline for this is this Sunday. It is, I believe, 11.55 in whatever your time zone is. Uh, that's the deadline. So make sure you get those in if you're interested. If you're just learning about this for the first time, um, this is our new Embedded Machine Learning Fellowship. We are offering an award of $6,500. Uh, that's in US dollars. It'll be translated if you are uh, international, obviously. Um, but really importantly, we also have AI mentorships from these experts at Edge Impulse. So you do not need to be a machine learning expert to apply to this. Um, you just need to have an understanding of how that tool can help your project go to the next level. And then you'll be able to acquire those skills by working with these experts throughout your fellowship, which is really, really amazing. Um, and we, on our side at Wild Labs, we're also going to help you access our community. We're going to put you in touch with other experts who can help you along the way. We're going to give you a platform to show off your work, show off all of the great things you're doing. And that really ties back into that idea of, you know, letting the rest of the community pick up that idea and run with it. If they see that you're developing something incredible with this tool, what could they do with it? How could they take it to the next idea? And so um, at Edge Impulse, we were just talking last week about how this is kind of a like a little spark that can light a fire that is the next innovation. And that's really how I think of people seeing the projects that will come out of this. So if you want to apply, uh, just head on over to Wild Labs. There's an application form. It's very, very easy. We just really want to know the details of how this support can help you. That's that's the most important thing. It's a very flexible uh, program. Eligibility, we've tried to keep it as open to everyone as possible. Very welcoming, very inclusive. Uh, the most important thing is really just tell us how this support can get your project to the place where you want it to go. Um, and like I said, Sunday is the deadline. Uh, make sure you get them in. We're so excited by the applications that have already been coming in. And I really hope some of you will throw your hat into the ring. Um, and we, we do also hope that more possibilities will come out of this. So the more people that apply and show us their ideas, the more we can take those ideas and say, okay, how else can we provide support for all of these great things that people want to work on? Um, and if anybody has questions, like I said, put them in the chat, put your hand up, or uh, just start talking, honestly. <laughs> um, we're, we're really happy to, to hear any questions you have about this process. Yeah, Tom, Tom, I just Tom, I just saw your application come in in the middle of this. Thank you, confirmation. <laughs> we did receive it. <laughs> yeah, I think just the last thing to say about um, we're really excited about this fellowship program, and we really see it as. A, a replicable model for partnering with the tech industry and, and helping helping make those relationships much more accessible to the broader community because it does take um, it does take access and time and um, relationships to be able to partner with the tech industry. And we get approached all the time by people 
tech companies wanting to get involved in conservation. And we think that by um, partnering with tech companies that are willing to not just put in like hardware, but to actually put up funding and mentoring and in-kind support and to work with us um, to go through this full application process, it helps find the partners who are, who are properly committed to conservation and who want to have an impact. And yeah, I think it's, we, we've, we've talked for a long time about matchmaking and how to do it effectively. And I think this is, and we've talked about building like a, a matchmaking portal and a funding portal. And I think actually it's not really so much about the technology as it is about the process and trying to connect the right people to the right, right, um, right funding and the, the, the conservationists and the tech companies together. I think this is, we're really excited to see how this, this can evolve. Um, yeah. So I know we're on the hour, so we're going to, we're happy to take questions. We're going to stop the recording and just say thank you very much for joining us. We hope it was interesting and um, really appreciate your ongoing support. And we're really excited about what's coming up in the near future. So um, we hope you guys are as well. Uh, we'll see you in two weeks for the next Tech Tutors episode. So you have a week off um, after this. So we'll catch it'll you all be later. a really good one. So uh, it's going to involve the National oh, Geographic okay. Critter Cam. So everybody keep an eye out for the registration. All right. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>